Hopkins, and welcome to the Hopkins Hangout Hour. It's Monday, March 29th, and beautiful, lovely looking day out there. But hold on to something tight, man, because that wind's going to whip you around. Uh, with us today, very thankful. Looks like we just pried him out of his uh, shell there for the past few months. The COVID looking Connor Deegan. Connor, how we doing? Doing well, Mike. Great to see you. Thanks for having me by. It feels like I, I've missed being on the hangout hour because I was in for like rapid fire sessions all through the fall and uh, talking about elections and town meetings and everything last year. So it's great to be back on. Well, yeah, it, because we're getting to that season again and we definitely need a new update because like everything else, everything's changed since the last time. And, and uh, but before we get into that, uh, how's things been, number one, from your perspective, and uh, congratulations on your recent wedding and so forth. We haven't had a chance to do that. But uh, how, how are things going for you up until now? It's been well. It's been extremely busy. Uh, we don't have the usual help that we get in the office just because COVID's still obviously an issue on people's minds um, and occupancy issues. So some tasks are still taking longer. Uh, obviously, you know, so there's some people who probably haven't seen their dog licenses yet. And that's because even though the dog license application deadline is April 1st, we have a backlog because it's just Lynn and I working to get all these through while we're doing all of our normal everyday stuff too. Yeah, because it's, it's more than just dog licenses that you do. I mean, let, let's, let's talk about licenses. You got marriage license, you have business licenses. I didn't realize that you needed what they call a DBA license when you're doing business as, you know, like for instance, if I was an accountant, I could be known as Mike Terosian accountant, have my business and I wouldn't need that. But if the name of my business was the awesome accountant, I would have to get a doing business license. And that's again, through your office. And what, why do we do yeah. that? So the, the reason that you get a DBA is to draw a legal paper trail between you, a physical person with, or an, a corporate entity even, with a tax ID number or social security number and a name that is otherwise fictional, that doesn't exist in any other legal, uh, legal means. So this just creates that so that then people can set up bank accounts and it will say this name is, might be what people are paying. They might be writing checks out to the awesome accountant, but the bank account is held under the social security number and, or tax ID number of you. Right. Well, tax it all together. And that is basically not so you get your taxes, but it's basically protect the customer. Yep. It protects the customer. It allows to also LLCs and everything. I know protect customers quite a bit more, but this also helps to make it so that there is clear legal entity that, of how someone's operating. It helps to prevent things like money laundering without being able to figure out who won't runs a business sure. or uh, sometimes I know that it became a touted as a way to help prevent uh, like terrorism from being able to collect money easily while in the U S uh, or without having it being able to be tracked. But, um, but otherwise it's banks require them for opening it. If you're not opening it in a name that's either yours or your corporate name or anything, but we've seen a huge uptick of them recently. Um, I think some of it is folks who realized that they didn't renew their licenses last year or even sometimes the year before. And then now there's all these grants coming out for folks who have small businesses. And some people are creating new small businesses probably because uh, of, you know, there's so, still been so many layoffs and everything and people who are still furloughed from work. Uh, and I think a lot of people basically took to turning some hobbies and everything into actual business, yeah. Yeah, businesses. That's, that's so incredible. we've seen a lot of really cool small businesses popping up over the past few months. Um, it's been a lot of applications coming through and they can be kind of time consuming, but it's been really cool to see all of them come through. That's great. It's, it's good to see people uh, working and, you know, I, can, I can't mention enough anytime I talk to people, you know, visit these small businesses, give them the support, you know, this, yep. these are the ones here that, you know, keep the money here. You know, that's basically, yeah. they, they usually live around here, work around here and they keep the money here. You know, you go to your box store and well, you just made somebody richer, some CEO that doesn't even shop in those stores. <laughs> All right. Exactly. So now I know it's been 
tough to, uh, COVID, uh, first off, getting married is hard enough, but performing them is tough for you. And you, you don't just give those licenses uh, to the people because a clerk can actually uh, marry someone, correct? So it, clerks have a, uh, the ability to be a justice of the peace outside of the limits on the number that the town is allowed. So towns are allowed a certain number of justices of the peace based on the population from the census years. Right. So uh, the clerk is allowed to be a justice outside of those numbers. So we're allowed currently not from the 2020 census, but from the 2010 census, mm -hmm. we are allowed three. So those three are already filled up, but I was able to sign on when I started as clerk. And so I have had the privilege of performing hundreds of marriage ceremonies for residents and folks in neighboring towns. And I absolutely love doing it. It's, I still say when people ask, it's one of the best parts of the job is to be a part of that with someone. It is a fun time. And as a minister myself and doing the weddings and I just do it for friends and family Yeah, uh, because I can make it a little extra special for them and everything. Um, it, I tell you, it's, it's a blast. You're, you're right there. And normally, I mean, you normally would marry people at your window. That's, I, I mean, I've normal. never liked doing them at the window because I feel like it takes away, even folks who just come in to do it, like they're like, I just want to get this done quick and get it over with. I'm like, you know what? let's just like, I'll, we'll go up to the select board hearing room at least. Like, uh, but since COVID hit, we haven't been able to get anyone in the building really. So I've been trying to come up with other creative methods of where we can do it. So the best one has been, if ever the weather is even like slightly warm enough, we've done the common yeah. because the gazebo is just the perfect spot for pictures too. And Always so- has. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like, it's the best spot to like take some folks over in the afternoon and go there. I've done a, a bunch in people's yards. Um, I, I did one where we did like a socially distanced wedding at their, they had a family house in Worcester. And so we went out there and did it. And it was, I mean, the whole thing was a, was a lot of fun too. And we've, I've done a whole bunch and it's a lot of people who are just like, you know, we, love each other. We don't want to wait. We're not going to wait for goodness knows how long until we can actually have a normal wedding. So we're going to just do it now. And I can't blame them. I did the same thing. So <laughs> and anybody can perform a, a wedding for one day, right? And what do yep. they have to do for that? So it's actually a really easy process. I was just talking to someone about it earlier today, actually. Um, you can pretty much do the whole thing through an online forum with the secretary of state and they give you a one day commission for to marry a specific couple on a specific day so you want to make sure you spell everything right and get the dates right but uh but a lot of people have a lot of fun with it and we give instructions when folks are doing licenses through our office anyway so that they can clearly see that like this is what you have to do and if people have questions on it, we'll, we're always here to answer any questions officiants have as well. If they're one day or, or a justice of the peace or, or a clergyman. Sure, because it varies from town to town, county yep. to county. Uh, like, for instance, uh, you know, I was in a situation where I, I performed one up in Maine, and now I'm registered here in Massachusetts. But Maine, they say, all you have to do is go to universalministries.com and you're done. That's it. And I says, well, okay, I already have that. Oh, then you're all set. You don't have to do anything. Oh, okay. Just send them back. In Mass, they make it so that you still have to be registered with the state. Yep. But even if, but if you're a member of the clergy, as long as you basically have an ordination certificate, yep. you can show them that, and they'll be like, "Okay, we'll put you in the system," and that's yep. it. That's 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 all I had to do. I I, yep. I registered with the state anyways, and just got it out of the way, and everything's all done. All right. Yep. So, other than that, it, it, here's the thing. Well, it, people, I hope understand that you know you are. You are the face of Hopkins when it comes to um, greeting outsiders. You know, new businesses want to come to town. Uh, people got questions. Everyone, everything falls on the clerk's lap up on that regard. And, but you're not just helping the public. You also are, are responsible for um, uh, making sure that the meetings for all our town boards and everything, right? right? So you, you're also helping out 
your your volunteer board members, you're helping out other departments. You you got a whole bunch of stuff to do. Yeah, we got a whole lot of stuff going on behind the scenes too. So there's a lot with uh, open meeting law, and uh, you know even with COVID and all that business can't stop. So it's you know we still have to make sure that we're able to receive and stamp in all the hearing notices and make sure everything is posted properly. Uh, and you know it's yeah, there there have been some challenges with obviously the building being closed, but uh, a lot of it is like some notices have to go on the doors, and then we still have obviously the online posting as well to make sure that it can still be accessible even when the offices are closed. Um, but you know that getting and obviously this time of year starting to get ready for town meeting as well. So it's uh, you know we have a whole lot going on in the background. All right, you said it. Let's go. All right. <laughs> We're going to do a town meeting was uh, just pushed to the following Saturday. Yes. And we're going to so, start nine in the morning. So let's start us off fresh. <laughs> what are we doing? Okay. So currently uh, it was originally going to be scheduled for the usual first Monday in May, which was going to be the third, but because of the concerns around COVID and how much it's going to be to, you know, keep a spot lit and heated for long period of time throughout the week. We decided it'd be far more prudent to do similar to what we did last year outside, start early and try to get it all done in one day if possible. So we're going to do it on Saturday, the 8th, 8th of May, uh, so that we can, and we're going to start at nine o'clock. Uh, so I urge folks to get there a little bit earlier, just in case we're going to do it at the football field behind the middle school this time around. Yep. Uh, but we're still gonna be able to park in the water tower lot and then we'll go down the access route for how people will walk there. And if anyone has an issue where they can't walk, we'll have the ability to, or you know, someone can't walk that far or doesn't feel like safe walking that far. We do have uh, a few golf carts and things like that that will be ferrying folks down. Oh, that's outstanding. So unlike the quick town meeting that we had to have, just to get the business out of the way. This is gonna be your regular town meeting. This is all the articles that we didn't have last year and the articles this year. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a full day. And, uh, and having it on a Saturday does allow you to have it on a Sunday if you don't finish on Saturday, right? That's true. I. I... We can definitely do that. There has been not much interest in going over to Mother's Day the next day, though. Really? I can't understand yeah. why. <laughs> uh, I, I've had a, a few uh, mothers who are either on boards or working in the building who have said, don't you dare do this to us. They're not. Well, this is the one day. <laughs> but so um, I, I, have a, I have a funny feeling that uh, a select board chair will stand up right away with the special instructions. We go until it's done. <laughs> you know, I think that's going to be our best bet. I think yeah. going until it's done for this time is, and, and granted, we managed to, I think it being a Saturday and people wanting to get through certain things a little bit faster is what helped with the last one for us sure. to be able to get through. And we, we were done before noon, right. which was awesome. Now, granted, you add bylaws and stuff into that, it's going to be a bit longer, but I think that we can definitely get through it much more quickly than a normal town meeting. I feel, feel like, you know, it's not going to be uh, the same type of situation where in a normal town meeting, everyone, at least most of the people, normal town meeting, they have had their dinner. They are coming in, they're ready to sit there and they're ready to stay there until 11 o'clock or whenever, but, uh, and then keep going after for subsequent nights. But I think on a Saturday, I think people will be more interested in once we hit the point where we've been saying the same thing over and over getting that question moved along to an actual vote and kind of just keeping everything flowing. Right. Oh, that's, that's a great idea. Do you think, uh, you know, I mean, you, you've heard all the talk afterwards, all the, all your debriefing after the last meeting that you did. Do you think people are going to like the idea? Maybe the town would adopt a Saturday town meeting like most towns do. So I know not, there's a big, big variety of towns doing one or the other. I'm not sure if it would be something that we would end up looking at adopting permanently. I mean, it could be something we review, but I know the the typical big concern around 
uh, or argument for trying to do Saturday meetings in a normal time period would just be, oh, you get more people to come. But that's also not necessarily the case. Typically what I've heard from other towns that do it is you get different demographics who come. You're right. Um, but you tend to get the same number of people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I don't really know what the best option is at this point. I think I've seen towns do both and say exactly that. They get different demographics and some people like have uh, practice and stuff like that on Saturdays and they can't show up for town meetings. So they need to do stuff with the kids or, uh, and so you, it's surprising how many people you think you're trying to help with getting on a Saturday, but really for this, it's, it's just a safety on the mind, health and safety. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. And I, I tell you, I know a lot of people, I, I actually enjoy the, the evenings myself. Uh, um, yeah. I, I wish they were done in one though. <laughs> see i'm a, i'm a night owl so i'm for me i'm like oh yeah i'm i'm up i'm ready to go i've got myself a little bit of coffee some water i'm good sure. i i would be fine with going to midnight on those but that's the difference yeah. <laughs> so all right now the layout is it's going to be the big football field you stadium yep and uh you'll have a stage on the track face it out to the field the people will be out of the field um of course hk will be there uh, broadcasting it live the uh, then what follows that is annual town election. Well, yes. That's, so that's your next step. Now you already have two elections under your COVID belt right now, um, and this will be number three. Actually, this will be four. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Four. Yeah, that's right. This was number four. So will you? I mean, you've learned a lot since the first one, and now that things are more open, now are you going to be? doing anything less or anything different or you just going to keep up the same safety standards because I mean right it depends on if we get different advice from the state and from our own health and safety team but currently right now we're looking at running it the same exact way that we've done the past three uh, we've had the plexiglass up mask wearing it, you know all these things are just good safety measures to have in place when we don't really know exactly uh, what's going on. And the last thing that we want to do is put any of our voters or poll workers in danger and risk sure. exposure when we don't need to. Right. Because uh, I believe, was it the last election? There was no uh, checking out. You just want yep. to So one of the, the rules that they did for it, they allowed it um, in the fall of last year from the state level is to remove the checkout tables. Uh, and that allowed us to focus on processing mail-in ballots a lot more significantly. And we're still allowed to do that. Now they've expanded it. So mail-in voting is expanded. So we can uh, continue using that for municipal elections for this year. Um, so that will be another option for folks who, if they're unsure if they're going to be able to make it to the election, then uh, it's a great little way to just make sure you get your vote in. Right. And when will those be available? Uh, so the ballots themselves probably won't be available for another couple weeks, but uh, someone can request at any point. Um, they can put in a request and then as soon as the ballots are ready, we'll print out right. mailing labels for them and get them sent out. So uh, you go to the hopkinma.gov website and go to your page. Yep. So yeah, and we'll have an application up there. Um, I haven't seen it. I know the secretary was going to create an application for the municipal elections. I okay. uh, haven't seen if they've released one yet, but when it is released, we'll have it up on our page as well so that folks can use that. Uh, and then if anyone doesn't have the capability of printing them, they can reach out to us and let us know. We will just mail them one or uh, hand them one at the door if they need it. You know, whatever it takes to make sure that folks can get their vote That's heard. Excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, the clerk's office has always been the most friendly and the most service orientated. I mean, you, you go out of your won't way. tell the other offices you said that. Oh, I mean, every, everyone's great at helping out, but I mean, with the clerk's office is always, you always seem to make it work, you know, other than go picking up people and drive them to the polls. I mean, you just, there's I mean, a popular great. saying amongst my, uh, my contemporaries in the clerk industry that clerks make it work. Uh, yeah. So we, we do what we can and we work hard to make sure that, uh, I mean, 
the residents as well as you know for for me it's my neighbors my friends uh you know i i like making sure that everyone feels like they got the best they could and the best chance they could for right it. yeah i think that's one of the reasons that the town supported for the many years when they try to uh, change the job around from elected to appointed and whatever i think they they felt that they needed somebody that was vested in this community um to be the face of you know let, let's face it you know you you're the face of the community uh, when it comes to um, the outside, because you know you're not just dealing with the Hopkins residents; you're dealing with all the visitors and people that need information uh, yep. about Hopkins. You know, and we wanted somebody to get it right and and find somebody who best represents it. And uh, and you're doing a, a swell job so far at that, which uh, everyone knows and appreciates. And um, the the other big thing now is after the uh elections are done and as i like to say for you things will slow down for you then which they never do um <laughs> what's what's the next big thing after the uh election so uh hopefully the next big thing after the election is uh just the start of the 2022 stuff because uh barring a special town election or town meeting you know we have a clear election schedule until uh, the next town election and uh, town meeting. And because that, that's one of the nice things about this time of year and these uh, odd year cycles too, is we don't have any primaries or anything at the start of next year. Everything's going to come up in the fall of 22. Uh, so even though it'll start going up on the cycle, at least we'll be able to focus on more of the the stuff that we haven't been able to do in the office uh, because of the pandemic and having to work remotely at points. And, uh, and when we have been here, it's been entirely focused on elections and light and the massive scale licensing, like dog licensing. Sure. Um, sure. So hopefully we'll be able to focus on some of that stuff, but I will say one more thing before we move on to anything else, yep. which is just so that people can make sure they've marked it in their calendars, the election moved as well. Yes. So, I, I just wanted to say that the election has been moved to May 22nd, which is also a Saturday, so that that way we're not going to have the risk of interfering with back to school operations, because now that they're moving back into having in person teaching, we want to make sure that we're not interfering with where they're going to be having lunch. Uh, that's the gym is where they're going to have lunch during the week. So um, we had worked for uh, quite a while to work with the uh, the principal as well as the superintendent's office to figure out what's the best chance for this. We talked about early release days potentially where they're not going to have lunch anyway, but we decided that, you know, let's go for a weekend for this year just so we can make sure that we're not having any risk of interference. We're not putting extra workload on staff as well over there any more than we have to. Yeah. So will the times be the same? 7 8? Yep, the times will be the same. 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Okay. And um so it being a uh, being a Saturday, uh, it, you know, of course, everything says this is this like one of your first Saturday elections. This uh, will be the first Saturday election because uh, like all the town ones have always been on Mondays, and all the state ones have been on Tuesdays. Except for I think my first one was weird, and they moved it to a Thursday because of it was a primary, and it was the strangest one because they found out it was scheduled on Rosh Hashanah, and they. Uh -huh. Then they said, oh, we can't have it on Rosh Hashanah, obviously. So they're like, oh, well, where are we going to move it? There's no other Tuesday to move it. So let's just put it on a Thursday. <laughs> That's wild. So with the uh, with, with that being the case, so number one, you're going to have more pocket because I can see you're not going to get the same crowds like you do on a Monday where you get your uh, off-to-work voter. Yep. And then you've got your lunch break worker uh, voter. And then you have, you know, everyone's coming home uh, to vote. Yeah. yeah, this one here, it seems like you're going to get the families in between sports because yep. uh, the spring sports will be uh, well and played by then. And uh, you'll have you'll have all the, the groups coming in. And it, it yeah. seems like you're going to have a, a more steady day. It, it could be. It's well. definitely going to be less predictable rushes. It might be more steady throughout the whole day. Um but it could show up like some other elections where, I mean, uh, if you look even most uh, 
pretty much every November election day, even though there are folks who are still working on that day, schools are out. Exactly. So we have seen that, yeah, pe more people will come in with their kids and stuff like that and throughout the day. Um, even this last few, so many people have been working from home that it changed entirely when we saw people come in. Right. Um, November was a prime example where I was going under the normal mentality of we're going to have like that morning, like before work, the lunchtime, and then the after work crowd. Those are the biggest rushes we usually have. Right. But we pretty much got rid of most of our, uh, most of our lists were all checked in by like probably by noon. Uh, everyone had rushed in in the AM to try to, I think everyone had the idea they were gonna get it all done in the morning. Um, and everyone was working from home at the time and everyone was like, oh yeah, we'll just go ahead, we'll get it done over with so we can go about our day. And then everyone else had done it early or by mail. So uh, we had majority of people do it earlier by mail. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that works too. Right. Now, just like everything that runs in this town, uh, it's, it's all based on our awesome volunteerism uh, that we have in this town. And, and your whole, with the exception of you, everybody's a volunteer there. And, and uh, do you need volunteers? If you want to be a volunteer, what, what do you tell people? So folks have the option as well when it comes to being an election worker. They have the option to either volunteer uh, or they can be paid. Um, a good number of our election workers are just minimum wage employees, essentially. And they uh, come in and they help us with town meeting, they help us with elections, they can do a full election day, they can do a half day. Um, and depending on if they're doing other tasks throughout the day, we can shift them over to other tasks uh, and have, you know, flexible ish hours on it. But I mean, that's really what we say to folks right off the bat is you can do this as a volunteer gig, you can do it as a paid gig. I have a few folks who um, they haven't had the ability to use their usual senior tax credit work off hours for the year. Right. And I have a bunch who will use it for the elections. Um, and so that was a, a good way for the last year for people who didn't otherwise have the normal opportunities that they have when coming into town hall or at the senior center, they had the ability to use those hours still right here. Oh, that's outstanding. Well, listen, Carter, uh, our time has flown by as always. And of course, it just shows I can't get everything into a half hour with you because you do too much. So stop it. No. But I talk too much too. I know. No, it's the two of us. The two of us just keep going. It just goes and goes and goes. That's why we can't pass each other in a grocery store. We'll never get our stuff done. Uh, but I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day. Uh, doing it too bad you won't let me in your office and stuck me outside. Yeah, I know. I locked the door. Social distancing and all, right? <laughs> yes. But uh, thank you again. And good luck with the town meeting and so forth. I'll be in touch with you um, to go over uh, our little election show afterwards. Yep. Uh, and so forth. But thank you again. I. Uh, I'm ready now to go to Matt Clark, who's going to give us uh, uh, give us a little update of what we're going to see on HCAM coming up uh, this week. So, uh, Matt, what's up? Uh, thanks, Mike. Well, we have a very busy week, and we also have a very busy day ahead of us. Uh, coming up at 4 p.m. this afternoon, we have uh, the JB Football versus uh, Ashland game airing on HCAM Ed and YouTube. And then we have um, the planning board meeting tonight, followed by the uh, Hiller Swimming and Diving team taking on Framingham at 720. Uh, tomorrow, we have the uh, very exciting EHOP Forum on the Main Street Corridor, airing at uh, 7 p.m. And on then tomorrow, uh, I'm going to be hosting a new hot edition of the Hopkinton Hangout Hour, where I will be talking with a few of my friends about the upcoming uh, Godzilla vs. Kong movie, a movie I've been waiting a very long time for and, and very exciting for. So that should be good. Fantastic. Thanks, Matt. And now for our next half hour, I'm going to take a little break here and pass it off, pass the reins off to Jim Cousins. Jim, you there? I am here, Mike. Thank you very much. It was a great conversation with Connor. Always a good time with him. He does so much. I, I'm just glad he was able to squeeze out 30 minutes for us. Yes, yes. Um, he is always a font of important and timely information. All right, so thanks for producing that half hour. Thank you, Jim.
Okay. And people, I'm talking to you now. You may or may not know this. I didn't know this until my next guest contacted me to inform me, but this is National Nutrition Month. And uh, I happen to be really interested in nutrition for a variety of reasons, which you may see <laughs> when some of my questions come out, uh -huh. but it's an important topic for all of us. Um, so uh, without any further introduction, I'd like to welcome Sue Ellen Anderson Hayes to our show. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Jim, at Hangouts. Appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. And thank you for reaching out uh, and letting us know uh, that this is that this is a month focused on nutrition. Exactly. Now, before we get into kind of like my questions and things like that, I always love to start the show when I have um, a guest I haven't had before. And let's hear a little bit about you and how you came to be doing the work that you do. Okay. Um, so a little bit about my background. So my name is Sue Ellen Anderson Haynes. Like you said earlier, I was born in Jamaica. Um, I lived there for many years, left, I went to New Jersey and Florida, and then I got my um, bachelor's from University of Florida, go Gators. I don't know if you're aware of the Gators, <laughs> but I am a Gator. Um, then I went to Andrews University and got my graduate degree in nutrition and wellness. I currently work at Joslyn Diabetes Center um, where we focus um, on you know, helping people with type one, type two diabetes, gestational diabetes, all different types of issues with blood sugar or regulation. I work specifically in the women's health clinic um, where we focus on prenatal, um, post um, pregnancy and postpartum care. Um, I'm also, um, recently I um, launched a business um, for women, girls and women's called um, 360 Girls and Women. So I could tell you more about that um, um, later. Um, I moved from Woburn to Hopkinton. So I'm, I'm here, uh, but my company is virtual mainly right now. And so um, I came about to this field when I was, um, I, well, I guess I gained interest in this field when I was in high school, I wanted to, well, in the medical field in high school, I wanted to do something with nursing and medicine. But then when I went to um, at, um, University of Florida, I kind of changed majors. I kind of was undecided. And I was like, you know, let me go talk to a counselor. So I spoke to a nutrition counselor and um, she advised me um, that, you know, there's a field called nutrition, um, it's called dietetics. I was like, what is that? And she, you know, she's like, well, you can work in the hospital, you know, as a registered dietitian, you know, you help people with their nutrition, people that can't eat, like they're on tube feed, you do calculations for their feedings or their IVs. You'll help all kinds of people, children, women, um, in, in the community, um, in corporate, in, in a hospital, in um, schools, all over. And I was like, oh, that's very interesting. And you also work, you know, beside other health professionals. So I was like, so I was like excited. And I said, you know, let me take a nutrition class. I took a nutrition class and I fell in love with um, nutrition. Um, I couldn't believe that like nutrition can help prevent disease. I could also help to reverse and manage a lot of diseases. Um, and one other thing that kind of inspired me to, to begin the field in nutrition um, is that my stepmom at the time was very ill and um, she got a nervous breakdown in medical school and they were, she, she was put on um, different medications and she was getting side effects from the medications. So she gradually weaned off and she found like, you know, holistic approaches to healing with using nutrition and and principles, principles from the Bible that she learned to kind of heal herself and get off these medications. And I was just in awe and I was like, wow, nutrition and wellness can do this. I was like, there's just no way that, so I just, the more I studied, the more I became, you know, more at all with nutrition. So that, that's kind of how my journey began. It's still going on. I still have other reasons, but that's like the short version. Well, that is amazing. And you know, I always like to say, I'm very glad that God makes people who like to do different things. Yeah. Because if that didn't happen, I would have to grow food for my family. And I'm not a very good farmer. So yeah. it's really nice that all, all different people in the world have all different kind of interest, especially and so I didn't know this that you worked at Johnson, my family is very well uh, informed about Jocelyn. It's, okay. you know, it's a class of people that I call life changers because yes. you interact with people and you change the course and the direction of their life. 
exactly. that's just super important. In fact, it's so exciting. We'll have to have you back on for more shows talking yeah. about that stuff. Yes. Now, November is um, National Diabetes Awareness Month. And that's that's very big. We really, really want people to be aware of that. But yeah, there's different there are just different themes for each month. And, and I would love to come back to talk about different things. So fantastic. It's it's a it's a booking now. <laughs> National Nutrition Month. Yeah. First off, you mentioned a couple of different things, but I would say, like, can we talk a little bit about what's the big deal? Why should we care about nutrition? You know, what's going to what what could we possibly other than maybe if we're looking to, you know, um, adjust uh, our weight or something like that? Like, what's the importance of being aware of nutrition? All right. That's a good question. Um. So I think the highlight is having nutritious, balanced meals and knowing how to cook your meals, knowing how to choose your meals, knowing how to read a label. Um, it's really important because nutrition helps provide energy for your body. So a lot of people these days, they may not have enough energy to do the things they, they want to do. They wake up and they still feel tired. They're having aches and pains because you know, inflammation is, is, is um, taking over the body. So nutrition is, is a key to help with you know, pain, inflammation, energy helps you to feel good, mood, it helps you to move better, right? And it also helps you to think better. And it, it, it actually at 360 Girls and Women, our power paradigm is nutrition, fitness, beauty, and mental clarity. And we use nutrition as the foundation of all our therapies because it is from the time you were in your mother's womb till the time you're here, right? Nutrition has kept you alive. And without it, you would not be around. So it is vital to life. We can't, of course, we can't live without water for a long time, but food, we can only live for a few days, few weeks for some people. So it, it's absolutely needed. And it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to eat. It's, it tastes, food should taste good. We should be happy to eat it. And so besides it providing energy for us, providing fuel for the brain and the muscles to help prevent disease and to, you know, help with disease, to reverse disease, disease in some instances or manage it. It's just like an awesome thing that we should take more advantage of, especially because we're also in a pandemic, right? We're still in a pandemic and nutrition is at the forefront because when we take care of our immune system, we can, you know, better fight if we have other illnesses, if cold, flu, you know, different things. So when we improve our immune system through nutrition, we live better, we sleep better, we think better, and we move better. Now, that's really interesting. And I'm going to come back to what you said about we should be having, we should be enjoying while we're eating, because it's all, <laughs> nutrition is always, talking about nutrition has always been kind of scary for me. Okay. But you did say a word I'd like to follow up on. And okay. that word is inflammation. Uh -huh. And like, how does what we eat affect inflammation and what's the, what's the, what's the result of the inflammation? Right. So a lot of research is going on about inflammation is still ongoing, but some drivers of inflammation could be um, excessive sugar and processed foods, um, and, um, saturated fat, for example. And why is that important? Because um, our cells, our cells um, feed off like vitamins like vitamin C, um, like uh, antioxidants, like beta carotene from carrots. Um, and when our cells use these nutrients, they provide, they prevent re free radical damage. So basically inflammation, um, let me really, let me go back. So foods that we eat, like antioxidants, prevent a breakdown of, of free radicals in our body. Free radicals break our cells down and cause pain, inflammation, and cause disease. So foods that drive inflammation make it worse are, according to research, excessive sugar intake, processed foods, high salt intake, and saturated fats. And so when we are consuming a diet high in fat, especially saturated fat, mainly in animal products, some are in a plant products like coconut oil and things like that, or, you know, palm kernel oil, but majority is um, saturated fat from animals. And when we're eating a lot of sugar, sweetened beverages, fast prep meals, um, you know, ultra processed foods that drives inflammation. Um, so what, what prevents inflammation usually is whole foods. 
whole foods, fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, seeds, eating your foods from home, baking, grilling, not frying much. Of course, you do want to enjoy your food. So there may be occasions where you're lightly sauteing or frying a particular meal, but excessive oils, using a certain certain amount of oils can be inflammatory. Um, there's omega-3 oils and there's omega-6 oils and different oils. We could talk about that later, but certain oils cause more inflammation. My clients, I go through a step process and going through their intake to see what's causing inflammation on their end. I go through nutrition, fitness, beauty, regimen, go through everything because food and fitness or movement is not the only part of health. There's more aspects of health. There's a mental part of health. There's a beauty part of health where I focus when women put things on their hair, skin, body that could cause inflammation. So inflammation, number one, is what we're ingesting, but also what we put in our skin, what we're breathing in. Is our air, is our air pure and on the inside? Are we getting fresh air on the outside? Do we have plants to help us detoxify the air? So it's it's just a lot of things that go into inflammation. I go through a one-on-one -on -one session with my clients for that, but just in general, foods can help prevent inflammation. They could also help to advance inflammation. So, uh, wow. All right. Just as a quick aside, I've never heard so much um, <laughs> <laughs> about that. Like I've always heard about read the label and these yeah. things are good, these, but I've never heard about all those other aspects that you just went through. Is this relatively new? No. So this is, as a lot of people may not be aware of, you know, some of the information I'm given, but it's all in research. And that's why I formed 360 Girls on Women, because I'm really passionate about women's health and, and how, you know, it's in how we've been, how we've been brought up with myths and information to take care of ourselves and why women are getting cancer. Cancer is number two killer in the United States. And a lot of women are getting breast cancer. Um, a lot of, of cancer is um, environmental driven. So people always say that, you know, um, genetic uh, loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. So you, we could have genes for even type one, type one diabetes for is another is not an example. There's the genes that you were, you know, that you have, but something triggers it in research. We still don't know what triggers the type one. It could be environmental. So, you know, the point is that, um, Everything that I'm saying, I, it's a holistic approach that I am taking along. And some dietitians view that holistically. Some, you know, maybe focus more on foods, but I focus on the whole thing. Where I, I, I focus on the whole thing, but nutrition is the focus, or I would say the foundation of my therapy or my treatment for my patients. But this is this is not this is not new. This has been this uh, wellness and nutrition has been studied for years. So um, you may not have heard it this way before, but. Um, it's not new. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I am a person who kind of grew up in a household when I was a kid where we had, you know, cream style corn and, you know, we didn't really know a lot of this stuff. So when I hear about nutrition, I get nervous. I get worried. I do. I will say one thing in my favor. Okay, is that for some reason I don't like cream style corn anymore. Uh, okay. It comes in like in the cream sauce. Yeah. Uh, it's just like there's just something about it that doesn't sit with it me. Turns but on anyway, you that's off. Yeah. yeah. But so like, I'm nervous. I'm nervous because I'm afraid you're going to tell me that I can't have anything that I like and I can no. only eat stuff I don't. Yeah, seeing a registered dietitian, many people believe that. You're like, you know, what are you going to tell me that I can't eat? What do I have to do? I'm so I'm so afraid. Like, don't. So what I do, I work with um, my patients and my clients to see what they like, what they're willing to change. And, and, and of course, I put culture in the forefront because National Nutrition Month is about personalizing your plate with culture. So if you grew up on a certain type of corn or a certain type of um, um, recipe, I wouldn't try to modify the recipe too much. I would just say if it depends on the nutritional status of the recipe, I would say, you know, maybe let's um, swap out the butter with, you know, a, a, a yogurt blend or something that's a creamy blend, or let's swap out, you know, those, you know, um, white potatoes with, you know, maybe a sweet potato, or maybe if you do want a sweet potato, let's to eat less of it. So I am, I'm not a dietitian that's a dietitian police, a food police that's going to say, you know, never eat that. Even people with diabetes can eat, can eat desserts that are sweet, but we, we, we help them manage it so that they can include it in a healthy plan. Or we may, give them a recipe that may be lower content of carbohydrates or sugar than an original recipe. So that's what we're here for. We're kind of like recipe experts and we do this for a living in addition to other things. But 
we should, you should never be afraid to go to a dietitian because, well, a good dietitian, because we actually are supposed to work with your needs, work with your dislikes, work, work with your culture, your background. We're not trying to take away foods and all these foods. Of course, there's going to be, you know, some changes, but we're not here to try to take all the foods you like and just give you, you know, rice and just meat and dried food and bland food and, and vegetables that you don't like. We, we want you to eat foods and we help you to think outside the box because, um, your taste, but we have so many different taste buds that you have. So we actually, we encourage you, I wouldn't say force, we encourage you to try new recipes so that your taste buds can get used to it, but we never take away foods that you love per se. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm interested. So now I'm kind of thinking about it. Is it going to be hard? Do I have to like learn new ways of doing everything uh, and unlearn the stuff that I've done my entire life? Well, so it's interesting that you say that because, you know, it takes a time to build new habits, right? And so um, some research says it takes like 18 days to 254 days, and then someone came up with 21 days. So it's not going to be hard and painful. It's going to take time as it is that you go through school and you're learning a new language or learning a new, um, you know, I don't know, you get in a degree, it takes time and energy. So nothing is easy. Even people that are, for example, want to lose weight, they say, you know, I've gained 50 pounds. And I say, you know, well, how long did it take you to gain those 50 pounds? It took you some time. You didn't gain it overnight. So it's going to take time to make changes. It's not going to be painful. And it's, it shouldn't be painful. And it shouldn't be something that is... Um, that is difficult for you to do. See, diets or fad diets, like I think you asked me that before, um, are the quick fixes that promise you all these things that are gonna happen instantaneously, but you can't sustain it. So as a registered dietitian, we teach you the how, the what, and the why of eating. We teach you how to do it so that you could teach your family, cook your meals, and when you go out to eat, you could pick according to what you want in a recipe, um, on the menu, excuse me, right? And if there's certain times you wanna treat yourself, you treat yourself. We don't even call those cheat days. We call it just living. Because when mm. you live, you treat yourself for anniversaries. You, just, you get a piece of cake. You, you, you know, you. There are people. Media. The media has this mentality that you can never eat what you like. You always have to drink green teas. You always have to do this. No, you can eat those things and still have a healthy life, and occasionally enjoy things that you like as well. So interesting. Um, why? Because like. When I look at different kind of diets, it is all about restriction. It is all about punishing. Yeah. And you're not talking about that. You no. know, you're talking about you're talking about fundamental things about how we prepare food and the the sources that we use in making yeah. the things that we like. And that's very different. Yes. Um how because the meat why if why if go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Why are fat, why are diets, fat diets like that even out there? Why aren't they replaced by what you're saying? Because you're saying your message is so much more positive. Yes. A lot of registered dietitians, we are, we're drowned out by the sound of the media. Um, the bit, the vitamin, the vitamin and food industry, I would say vitamin supplement food industry. So in that sense, they're like multi-billion dollar industry. They come up with supplement shakes and none of them has a nutrition degree or is even a registered dietitian. They formulate these things. They have people uh, that are celebrities, you know, come up and say, oh yeah, this is great. I've lost, you know, 200, you know, hundred pounds and I feel good. Or, um, you know, it's just, it's the way how we were, the society is made. You don't see a lot of registered dietitian on, <laughs> registered dietitian, nutritionist on the TV given commercials. You no, know, because no one really wants to learn about the way of really truly living. Now, now there are more dietitians getting out there and spreading the word than before because it is so, um, a lot of people are, you know, caught up in the diet mentality of um, it's either this way or there's no way, right? There's, mm -hmm. you know, you either, eat healthy, you never enjoy your food, you're restricted, like you said, all the time, and you just have to eat the way you're given. And that's it, you have to do exercise, you don't like you have to feel pain, and you have to hurt all the time when you're in exercise. No, it's not always that way you could enjoy movement, you could lose weight and enjoy eating foods you really love. Um, and of course, they're healthy, and we teach you how to enjoy them. And then you have your, your cultural traditional foods as well. Um, but unfortunately, the media teaches fad, fad diets like keto diet, give up carbs, you don't need carbs. And unfortunately, you do need carbs for brain development. Even at, at the diabetes clinic, we talk about not restricting carbs, you need to eat some form of carbohydrates. <laughs> and but the media, um, all these different types of diet restrict this nutrient, don't eat that nutrient, don't eat that. 
Um, so yeah, it's we teach science evidence based. So everything that I'm telling you, there's science to back it up. I could send you articles on this afterwards if you want, but plant based eating is like the way to live longer. Plant based, and I could talk more about that if you want to. But um, it's it's a lot of garbage out there. And so we have to know how to separate the garbage from the truth, right? And so right. seeking out experts, registered dietitian nutritionists are according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the nutrition experts in, 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 in food and nutrition. So when you are going to, when you have a nutrition or food questions, you definitely want to seek out an expert in that area. You know, whether you're a diabetes specialist, you know, a woman specialist, um, kidney specialist, sports specialist, we have all kinds of specialties. And the doctors should be really referring a dietitian to people who need the help. And that's that's one of the reasons National Nutrition uh, Month is here as well, because we, are, we want to advocate for the, the, the world to eat healthier, but also we want to make sure that people are aware of what registered dietitians can do to improve the health of the world one bite at a time. <laughs> right. Okay. So I do want you to follow up with uh, a plant-based diet is kind of the way to go, but it, it is, as part of that, um, I'm interested if you could touch upon what are some of the, like in general, so we kind of get an idea of what we're looking at. What are some of the metrics that you look at? You know, is it carbs? Is it protein? Is it this? Is it that? And then please describe what a, a plant-based life sounds like. Okay, sure. So as far as metrics, like what, what are some metrics that an individual should look for like when they're assessing themselves for health or what are the metrics that as a registered dietitian look for? What is... What so, you would recommend okay. as I am trying to okay. go through life and eating better. Right. So one of the things we ask people to look for is, well, your energy level. How are you feeling? So as we put you on like, you know, a lifestyle therapy plan, right, to change the, the way you're eating, living, sleeping, um, fitness, all that, we ask, how are you sleeping? Are you sleeping? Are you going to bed? sooner, fall asleep sooner? Are you waking up feeling energized? So that's something you want to check off. For women, how is your menstruation? Is it heavy? Is it painful? For you know, Are you having joint pain? Are you having nausea after you eat? GI discomfort? Is it much? Is it better after you eat? When you, are you feeling heartburn? So all these issues are related to your gut microbiome and how you know, you're know you feeding yourself and stress levels and things like that. So uh, metrics are your stress level, your mood, your energy, your blood pressure. Are you monitoring your blood pressure at home? If I see a client and I'm seeing them for um, reduction for their blood pressure, I put them on special foods, you know, supplements, spices, you know, reduction of salt and things of that sort. And so I measure that and I have my patients measure their blood pressure. You know, what is it? Is it, is it, is it less than 120 over 80? Are we getting close to the goals that we establish? For example, cholesterol levels. You know, if you're seeing you and you have high cholesterol, the plans that we have spoke, spoken about, how do we know if it's working? And well, I'm going to test your cholesterol level after a certain amount of uh, months we, that we've been together, right? Right? So that's one way to look at that's another metric cholesterol level, blood pressure, blood sugars. When I teach, when I see patients with um, diabetes or, or insulin resistance, we're testing blood sugar numbers or pulling A1Cs, which measures your blood sugar over three months. And then they're able to see the improvement. They're like, wow, my A1Cs went down two points. You know, it was, you know, you know, it was a 6.2. Now it's a six. So it went down to like a 5.5, which is, you know, great. You know, so we're measuring, we're having them measure that as well well when they go for their blood work and they come back and they say, you know, what I'm doing in my lifestyle, the things, the nutrition recommendations that my dietitian has taught me are working because I see it in my results. My waist circumference is another measurement to look at. Men should have a, a waist circumference of less than 40 because waist circumference is a predictor of heart disease, type 2 diabetes, um, high cholesterol. It's just a metabolic issue. And so if your waist circumference is a certain measurement, we have individual measured your waist circumference. It's, if the inches are going down, you're able to fit in your clothes, you feel better. You could bend over and play with your child. You could breathe better. So these are some things, some are clinically, some are clinically based that we have to get measured in, in, in your doctor's office or you, when you go to the city dietitian. And some are not clinically based because it's basically how you feel, right? Your mood, your sleep, your stress, your pain level. I mean, who wants to live in pain, have, can't sleep, can't have GI discomfort after you're eating, you know? So those are some things that you wanna look at. You know, I think that's really, you, you blew through that really fast. That is so fascinating, um, so fascinating so that a nutritionist, mm -hmm. when I ask about metrics, is talking about everything Health. that is not nutrition, I, first, it's like stress. It's like sleeping. It's like pain. So like, 
you are really focusing yes. on where the person is at and how what they eat can make them feel better. And by the way, I just want to ask, are you having patients at Jocelyn with a 5.5 A1C? <laughs> I've had people that are were pre that were in a pre-diabetes stage that has dropped their A1C down to no diabetes. I've seen patients that has the diabetes that dropped it into the pre-diabetes. Yes, with wow. I, whether yes, I've seen it at Jocelyn, but I've seen it before Jocelyn too because it works. It is yeah. it, it's it's a way of living. Um, if you can work with a nurse, practitioner, dietitian, endocrinologist, it's a team approach, right? Also, at three sixty girls and women, I just don't you know I refer out if there's a p- particular patient that needs an endocrinologist. I'm working with the endocrinologist because as a dietitian, we work with as a team. So yes, we are seeing people drop levels. Um, and, and, and blood sugars. And, and, and I talk about sleep and stress because do you know when you're stressed, your cortisol levels increase and your blood sugars increase? So as a dietitian, we ask, how's your stress? You know, do you need to see a mental health therapist? Do you need to talk about exercise and therapy to reduce stress? So I, I went to school, like I said, for my nutrition and wellness degree. So not only am I expert in nutrition, but I'm also expert in wellness. So mm. I address all aspects of health, not nutrition, not just nutrition and not just fitness, all aspects. I am so glad that you emailed me. This is so <laughs> fascinating. Now we got a few minutes left. So talk to me about a plant-based lifestyle. Oh, right. Okay. Right. So plant-based lifestyle. So a lot of, there's a lot of talk going around on the internet and in research about what is a plant-based diet. So there's, there's different types of plant-based diet. Um, there is a vegan plant-based diet where you're just eating, um, no animal products, just fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, and seeds, or you're a vegetarian. You could be lacto vegetarian or over where you're eating milk and um, cheese, uh, dairy, and eggs. And that's plant-based as well. Another plant-based style of eating is called um, a pescatarian, which they eat everything else. We just mentioned the, you know, uh, fruits, nuts, grains, uh, vegetables, you know, maybe they eat dairy or not. Um, maybe they eat eggs or not, but they may, their main source of uh, meat is fish, you know, seafood. So that's a pescatarian. Those are, also, those are considered plant-based eaters. And um, we also, you know, so there's this, this in between, those are the, those are the major types of plant-based eaters and research has shown that, um, well, I've done like some studies on the microbiome. There was a study released called, um, I believe, the Nature Study, where they had, where they looked at individuals, over a thousand individuals, and their gut microbiome, how they um, reacted to the foods they're eating, and if that if that created. Um, markers like health markers like did that create an inflammation marker did that create uh, increased risk of diabetes blood sugar so they they collected all the, the, these different markers and they tested bloods and drug levels and they found out in this study which is um was in the new york times um as well that people that ate vegan and vegetarian um and the ones who ate eggs and fish were the individuals who had the lowest risk of heart disease type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome, inflammatory disease. I mean, so plant-based eating, you live longer. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of something called the blue zones. Um, the blue zones is where individuals live longer day and they have individuals in Greece. Um, you know, they eat a specific you know, way of eating the Mediterranean um, diet, right? That's also considered plant-based because they eat as well, um, you know, fish, uh, olive oil, a lot of mono unsaturated fats, which are like, um, olives, avocados, and things like that. So that's what plant-based eaters are, are, are eating. That's why they're living longer and having less um, chronic disease. And chronic disease is high in, in, in America. It's, it's, it's a killer. So, yeah. um, you know, we still need to eat foods we enjoy, cook them in a special way, but we need to eat more plants. America, us Americans, we're not eating half as much fruits and vegetables as recommended. So I, as a dietitian, I help my patients, whether you're young, old, I try to figure out healthy, um, versatile ways to put these plant foods in your diet and give you recipes and give you different spices so you could try. And if you go out to restaurants, I try to, you know, give you different ways to look through menus and, you know, experiment. But those yeah. are the major plant-based diets and um, that those are the benefits. Okay, perfect. All right, now this is going to be a challenge for you. You only have 30 seconds, okay? <laughs> I want to tell me what's happening with 360girlsandwomen.com, 360girlsandwomen.com. What oh, wow. do you do there? 
Okay, so 360goalsofwomen.com, we use nutrition as the foundation to help women journey through complete health, physically, mentally, mentally, and spiritually, so they could achieve com the complete you. And so we use four paradigms, as I mentioned earlier, we use nutrition, fitness, beauty, mental, and mental clarity, as they uniquely apply to adolescents, young women, older women, and motherhood. So basically, 360 represents completion. And so we address complete health through the complete life cycle. And we use, um, you know, nutrition therapy along with other holistic approaches um, in wellness to help a woman get to the complete health that they want. So that's essentially what 360 Girls and Women is about. Perfect. Shawan, thank you so much. I really look forward to our next, our next uh, time too. Thank you so much for having me today on your show. It was a pleasure, Jim. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you for watching this episode. See you next time.